I want to start with the sort of obvious question, but in this case, it's a really interesting one. This, unless I'm wrong, this is the only film of yours that really has music as a crucial element, the central element to it. How did you get, why were you drawn to this story? Well, I mean, in the first place, I grew up as a Gilbert and Sullivan fan. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, I, 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 there are all sort of various things, um, really. One was that um, I, I just thought it would be an interesting thing to explore. But also, I wanted to, because of the kind of films that I, this is very obvious, really, the kind of films that I had always made, right. contemporary films, etc. Um, I just thought it would be um, good to just buck the trend, really, uh -huh. do something different. Uh -huh. But here's the thing. Um, obviously, what I'm always concerned with, all of my, my films, um, and have continued to, to, to be, is to put on the screen real people, like real people, behaving like real people, right. uh, and it worked at, in a quite um, detailed and complex way, to bring them to life. Right. And so the thing about this is, I mean, you know, here is this ostensibly um, superficial chocolate box subject. Right. But actually, what, it re what the film is, is about people doing what they do, people right. doing a job of work, people taking um, the, the business that we all do in the entertainment uh, industry of uh, slaving ourselves to the bone to ent entertain other people with our, own, with our trivialities. Right. And these, you know, <laughs> People are, are, that's what it's about, basically. So, you know, I mean, I'm always fascinated by, obviously, how people are, how people relate, how people behave, what people do, what, you know, there's work of all kinds in all of my films. Right. And that's what we're doing here. Um, uh, uh, and so, really, that was the, the, the motivation. Uh -huh. the, I was going to ask this question toward the end, but I think... Uh, I want to ask it toward the beginning now. Um, there, in recent years, last 10, 20 years especially, there's been criticism of the Mikado that for it embodies racial stereotypes, it makes fun of Japanese people. And I thought, even when I, in 1999, I thought you were already on to that question. You were already dealing with it in the way you made the film and the attitudes that you brought out, especially Gilbert's attitude toward Japanese culture toward the sor sources. What is your f feeling about that? Well, I mean, I mean, I know that in in this city, um, the New York Gilbert and Sullivan Society have had terrible trouble trying to st stage the Mikado. Right. Um, even uh, my um, friends at the National Film Theatre, the BFI in London, where there was a retrospective before uh, Christmas. Uh, when they screened this film, and incidentally, I got them for fun uh -huh. to screen the 1953 biopic, The Story of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh -huh. with Robert Morley and oh, right. Peter Finch, yeah. and thing. Uh, just because we'd had copies of it kicking around when we were preparing this, and, uh, and I put in my program note, is this film, is our film a reaction to this one? Well, a tiny bit. Uh -huh. uh, but um, in, in the program notes for both of them, even those guys had to put um, warning. There are um, Asian people being depicted by, uh, being played by, you know, non-Asian actors. I think it's rubbish, basically. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody who, I mean, anybody who decides to interpret this in any shape or form as racist is uh, blinding what they're seeing by their own prejudices. Right? Well, I also think, I found in this um, biography of Gilbert, there's a quote that I thought was very, very good. This came out in 2011. Um, the author is Andrew Crowther. Yes. And, he's, and it's, uh, he says that the Mikado does not p portray any of the characters as being racially inferior or indeed fundamentally any different from the British people. And then this is great. The point of the opera is to reflect culture through, through the lens of an invented other 
a fantasy Japan that has only the most superficial resemblance to reality. Well, I mean, of course, the Mikado has got as much to do with Japan right. as I mean, just nothing to do with it at all, really. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, but of course, you know, it, it, it is the case uh, from what we understand from all that we research, it is the case that for all that if it had nothing to do with Japan and it was a complete piece of nonsense, uh -huh. but Gilbert was nevertheless very preoccupied, as you see in the film, with getting it authentic. And Th and that's what's very fascinating and moving to me in the film, and that's why I think you were on to this already uh, w w when you're taking it on, that he gets obsessed with the idea that it has to be authentic. Absolutely. And that it, it, this is uh, Mrs. Six, Sixpence, please, you know, yeah, yeah. Who, and who I have, you've heard me speak of with reverence and respect. You know, and then when he, this scene when he brings the three young Japanese women into it's just beautiful. And of course, they don't speak in, any English. They it, don't know it, what it he's doing. It is one of my favorite scenes in my films. Wow. Actually, yeah. that. And I'll tell you something interesting about that scene. Um, it's just anecdotal. But, but, but um, we shot that. We spent five. We, we, ha we had to find a theater to film in. Uh -huh. And it so happened that this particular theatre, which is the Richmond Theatre in West London, was free for exactly the time we needed for five weeks. Uh -huh. it, it was dark uh -huh. for the time we needed a theatre. Um, but we ran out of time to do... Because we were st it took so long to do this, the on-stage stuff that we ran out of time to do all the backstage stuff. But we had to shoot that scene on the stage. On the stage, yeah. And... We got to the last day, and we had to get out because a real show was coming in. Um, and, uh, we had a day, and we hadn't created the scene because, as you know, I mean, I improvised the actor, improvised, and I build the scene, write it in the rehearsal, and we hadn't done it, and we hadn't had time, and so the whole thing was cobbled together in one day, uh, with the gun pointing at us because we had to get out. <laughs> And there is something about the scene, I always feel, that benefits from, the, from that pressure. Uh -huh. Because there's a kind of, I mean, you know, I don't linger on anything. Right. I mean, it, you know, I just think you might find that interesting, really. You know? Yeah, and, uh, but he um, he's gets, uh, I think, in the scenes when he first starts reading the libretto to Sullivan and then to his wife, he's so grim and serious. And, and I watch him in this, you know, Jim Broadbent in this film, and I, that's the Mikado. That's what they were after. That, it's that attitude. Yes. And the production, when I saw the film, I thought, oh, are, are you going to direct a stage production of the Mikado? I was longing for you to do it. But, uh, I, I, I'm not, I did do the Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> yes, I know you did Pirates. For English yeah, National yeah, Opera. Yeah. Yeah. I always said when we made this film that I, would, I had no interest in d directing a uh, 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 Gilbert and Sullivan opera, but I um, I did do that, and yeah. it was great fun. Yeah. I, we enjoyed it. Yeah. But when in the the scenes of the performance, you know, in the f are just it's like my ideal of what Gilbert and Sullivan should be. Well, apart from anything else, everything you see in the film of the uh, actual shows, we worked meticulously from the original prompt copies, uh -huh. which we we sourced and uh, and are available for. for in the archives, and working with the uh, choreographer Francesca Janes, uh, we put together. Well, she she really did the groundwork in blocking and arranging the the, 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 um, the sequences. And so, what you're looking at, and the same is true of the design, is pretty much uh, uh, as close as we can get without having been there to what those shows were like. You know? But th this Gilbert. He gets the, what to me is the essence of comedy is that the performers are not in on the joke. You take it seriously, yeah. you know, and, and that comes through in every, every moment of it. And, you know, when, when you finally see it, like the bow, bow to the daughter-in-law elect, she's terrifying, sure. you know, <laughs> and he is terrifying. And they never lose that, that, you know, like, and also I think what you capture beautifully is what I think it was really like. The audience, the, so many Gilbert and Sullivan productions are bad because they f are full of jokes and they speed up things and they try to entertain. Um, this, this one, the, you see the audience 
riveted. They're not laughing out loud. They're riveted. They're following. It's, they're obviously entertained. Some of them have the librettos. They're following the words. Yeah. The, the, and that's in the debate that we see between Gilbert and Sullivan about, oh, I always respect your words too much. And, oh, no, my words are so... No, no, words that come first, I think. Words come first in Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, you know, uh, at least... And Sullivan wrote, wrote music that really supports them. But, but it was... Um, I, I just thought all... all all that stuff was great. Now, we see Gilbert in your movie go through a kind of evolution in his attitude. I mean, he gets the, he goes, uh, when he's in that costume fitting scene, he, he's trying to, Mr. Levy, he's trying to calm him down. He says, you know, this is not grand opera in Milan. It's mere low burlesque in a small theater on the banks of the Thames. But then later, you know, uh, he says, you, when he's doing the, the, the dance, he says, this is not, Low burlesque. This is not. Lo this is an entirely original Japanese opera, and yeah. he evolves to that. I think. Well, yes. I, you, uh, that's giving the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Just thinking about Gilbert himself. What? What was it about Japanese culture that you thought that you think may have f fired this? Well, in I mean, the, the the thing was, it was very fashionable. Yes. Uh, in that period. Right. I mean, you know, uh, f and it had been for s s since the beginning of the, uh, of the Meiji period, uh, some 30 years earlier. Um, and, I mean, this Japanese exhibition that, that happened, which if anyone's interested, the site, the, the hall where it happened, is in where Westbridge, um, yeah. the I Imperial College is just behind the Royal Albert Hall, now in London. Um, but the things Japanese, uh, you know, the aesthetic movement was influenced right. by things Japanese. So it was very much in the zeitgeist. Right. Um, and I think what he was doing, apart from anything else, uh, just as he um, lampooned, had previously, a few years earlier, lampooned the aesthetic movement right. in their opera Patience, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, I mean, he was smart enough to take a subject which was in the zeitgeist and was kind of fa fashionable and subvert it. But, um, I, I mean, obviously our um, creation of the Japanese village and his reaction to, to what he uh, saw um, assumes that he was seduced by it. But I have something interesting about the Japanese village. Nowhere does it say anywhere that, that you can read about this. I mean, we know that he went to the village right. and there were lots yeah. of stuff there, but nowhere does it say that there was a theatrical performance. Uh -huh. But when we did the research, when we started the research and we looked at the plans for the actual Japanese village, which we found, there in the corner of the space, uh, of the exhibition, was a theatre. Uh -huh. So we thought, I thought, well, let's get hold of a a kabuki play uh -huh. and distill it uh -huh. and with the collaboration of those excellent Japanese actors yes. we do this distillation well of course having Gilbert watch that with its kind of with its violence right. and things given the, 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 the actual subject matter of the Macau you know which is very much to do I mean if it's not about violence it's not about anything about you know punishment right. and yes. it's relentless <laughs> you know so I thought that in, in a way that but that is um a concoction. I, I, I have no idea whether it really is. <laughs> well, it? speaking of concoctions, you do, you go also in the film with the mythologized version that was passed down by by people involved in in the creation of it, uh, because the the actual exhibition happened. He had already written what, Act One. He of had. No, no, I know. It's when true. the when that opened up. Absolutely. But as the biographies make clear, the trade with. Japan was already thriving. Yeah. London was agog with Japanese culture. You know, Absolutely, uh, that's I, what I'm so saying, yes. So it was, it was in the atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, it's dramatic license. He had, right, right. He had started, he had the idea already right. because it was in the zeitgeist right. and it was fashionable. Right. Um, but I thought it would be more fun for him to... Yes, um, of course, I mean, yeah. It's also, I mean, we don't know whether or not it's apocryphal that the sword fell off the wall and right. inspired him. He said, he, the first you discover about that was he says it in an interview in about 1907. Mm -hmm. um, in the earlier version, the 1953 uh, chocolate box version of this story, the movie, by Launder and Gilliatt, um, 
the wind the, the window blows open and it that blows the sword off the wall. Uh-huh. But we just I, I mean I I invented the notion that he bought the sword implicitly is implicitly bought the sword at, that day. At that, that you know. day. But yeah, these yeah, are yeah. all <laughs> dramatic light, you know. That's you know. okay. <laughs> That's a, it's a film. It's a drama. You know. Um, Absolutely. And also the the this is comes up for biographers all the time that you, do you try to find out what actually happened or do you go with the stories that the people you're writing about actually told, you know, and the, well, I think for uh, the purpose of a film, you go with the stories they told. Yes, but also, I mean, there's quite a lot in the, in the film which is dramatization of what yes, actually happened. Of course. Yeah. But you're a, a, um, a, 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 a classical music critic. Yes. Are you going to talk about Sullivan? <laughs> yes, we should talk about Sullivan. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm happy to. We, um, uh, uh, when we met, um, I just should share this, when we met at, at before this afternoon, um, I, I said how great it was that Anthony is doing this. But I said the person who will be most delighted and impressed will be Sullivan. Sullivan. Right. <laughs> yes. No, I admire the music tremendously. I love the scene in the salon um, at, at uh, his... Uh, it's not right to call her a mistress. This is rom- his romantic partner. She's, she was it. She was his mistress. She, well, but she. I mean, she has a husband who is. Yeah. Not. He doesn't. You know. He's no. Not they were. They were. Uh, she yeah. separated from her husband, but right. she was she, Sullivan. No yeah. question. Okay. She was Sullivan's mistress. Well, then we'll use that word. Okay. okay but uh, but she's uh, ho- having this musical soiree, and my reading of the scene is Sullivan walks in, and this pianist is playing a fairly recent foray piece. Correct. You know, a nocturne. Yeah. And it's this, you know, fresh from France, this piece. And, and it's, the, it was kind of avant-garde, wasn't avant-garde. it? Avant-garde. Yeah. The yeah. harmony is murky and yeah. ambiguous and chromatic, and it just has all these little textures. And Sullivan walks in, and you, I see him looking like, this is where I belong. This is who I am. You know, this is where my future is. And then his mistress says, oh, we have one more little thing for you, another promising composer. And he brings out... The Lost Court, which is really, I don't know, maybe you love it. I don't know, but... Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's not a question. The point is, it is one of his... It was, he, it, it was, was one of hugely the two, popular. One of the two particular things he was most famous for. Yes, it was very famous. Onward Christian Soldiers. Right? Yes, but it's very corny, and it's, it's, yeah. it's full of these pieties, and, and also the whole idea that this court I stumble upon, and it's lost forever, and I'll never find it, and, and uh, the, the actual... Uh, a- anyway, I mean, he, he, I do think you, I have the words. You, um, do, you, do you like the Weber? The Weber? The yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that's wonderful, too. Yeah, that's uh, the, the that's piano. The, it's yeah. the, the, yeah. the piano duo, the, the, uh, the, duo, the double yeah, piano yeah, thing, yeah. yeah. But Sullivan, t- I, I think, as he says in the film, you know, my qu- the queen, my country, my queen, expect from me a grand opera, big things, big classical pieces, big concert pieces, and... He was a superbly trained musician. Mm-hmm. You know, he went to Leipzig. He had excellent teachers, and uh, uh, was, uh, he was a good conductor. He conducted Beethoven's Seventh mm-hmm. Symphony, sure. and, uh, um, and he was a good pianist. Um, but he wasn't original in his, his concert comp- pieces. He was very good at evocating, uh, ev- evocative things. And uh, so that's perfect for comedy, a little you know, British ditty or a British anthem or a minstrel song or there's even a magical, beautiful magical mm-hmm. in Act Two of the yeah. beautifully written. It's not original, but um, sure. but that that's where he really excelled. And I think Gilbert's words really brought out the best sure, in him no musically. Question, yeah. yeah, but I didn't. I don't think he'd like to hear that. No, uh, no. Um, do you know any of the? Do you know much of the concert music? Do you? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. No. yes. I mean, I've done my research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, but then the other, you know, linking it to other films. I mean, the personal stories of all the characters in this movie, starting with Gilbert and Sullivan. My goodness, what a relationship they had. I mean, what a prickly but codependent and interesting relationship. Did Did, did you know all that about them when you went into this? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I I read about it for a long, long time and. So finally, you, yeah, of course. And, right. uh, and it was about bringing it to life, you know, and doing the kind of work that I always do on my films of working with the actors and making characterizations. Yeah. Um, in terms of, inven- I mean, G- Gilbert had no children, but 
the whole asexual, asexual his sort of sexlessness, which is very poignant in the scenes with with Kitty yeah. in their bedroom. Is that did you is that based on? Yes, stuff I mean there? it's yeah. it's it's uh, yes, it is. I mean it is an interpretation of what we understand. I mean. Um, he died in 1911. He yes. drowned in his lake trying to rescue two young ladies um, who got into trouble swimming and wow. had a heart attack. And in 19, I think 90, uh, something like 1915, somebody asked Kitty, his wife, um, she said, they said, life was very difficult now w without. Sir William, by which time right. she said, "Well, it, yes, but it's not half so difficult as it was when he was alive." When he was alive, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's, and also the the final that last scene in their bedroom is so poignant to me when she says, she, when he says, "You know, it's just hard for me to take praise, and I just, I never know how to." And, and well, she says, oh, but it must, you know, imagine if just commonplace people, just for being themselves. So -and -so. Well, of course, there in that scene, I mean, there's no way what, what, what goes on in that scene is uh, drawn from anything. I mean, we've made that up. Right, you made that up. I mean, the whole thing of this surreal, ambitious um, idea that she's improvising uh, you know, with, you know, uh, nannies pushing empty perambulators right. around and her st strangling on her own umbilical, c c all that stuff, you know, stuff. Right. I mean, we, Leslie Mandrill and I, we, we, we sort of constructed that. And I mean, I, I wanted, you know, it was very important at the end of the film, having finally got to the, the, um, the sort of chocolate box climax of the success of the Mikado. Uh, I mean... You know, conventionally, you'd say, "Well, that's where the film ends." Right. But it was really important to set to, to you know implicitly say that these are people. Right. You know, and so that's what we get that scene, and then you get um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ronalds actually telling Sullivan that she's pregnant. Right. And, but it's 1885. I can handle it myself. Right. Um, and that's based. That is based on. She had a whole number of yes, uh, 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 pregnancies, and then. Of course, what you see at the very end, the, the penultimate scene in the dressing room, um, sh sh uh, Leonora Braham, who, of course, you understand, was alcoholic. What she's saying, as many people here will know, is Yum Yum's speech that precedes that song. Right. Yeah. Um, and we just have this idea of her do doing that speech to herself, pissed. <laughs> and then you get the, this... Wonderful song, uh, right. which is you know. beautiful song, uh, uh, and so. But I did feel the the need very important to to bring us down to r reality in those last moments of the film. Really. But I I know the way you you do work, as you just said, and you improvise and you draw things out of the cast members. But so the Leslie Mandel, she came, she was part of that whole invention of the perambulators and the yeah yeah. Wow. We collaborated to do that. You yeah. did wow yeah. Um, the ca uh, as the, the musician in me wants to ask about ha casting the movie, uh, you know, uh, like, did you, how much did you go for their singing ability? How did, much did you consider Everybody that, that, sing, yeah. that sings in the film is actually it's singing. Actually singing yeah. Everybody that's playing an instrument right. can do it. I mean, we auditioned, uh, I mean, the, we, Gary Yershon, who was the musical director on this, and who's composed the music for my more recent films. Right. Um, I mean, we are, I mean, I auditioned actors, uh, just acting auditions first, and then we brought them back, and everybody had to come to, the, to a singing audition. They had to sing two things. They had to sing a piece of Gilbert and Sullivan, uh -huh. which meant that some people had to go and find out what it was, right. <laughs> and, and an, something else. Right. And, uh, and all sorts of people came, really good actors that you would love to have had in the film, but they couldn't sing, right, um, right. so they weren't in it. Right. Um, but everybody that, uh, that, you, that you... An interesting thing about Shirley Henderson, who plays Leonora, she'd never Henry heard Henry of Gilbert. Gilbert. She'd never heard I, of her, yeah. She's I will tell her. Yeah. She, um, <laughs> she didn't know Gilbert until she, she was just, she, she was a folk singer, really. Uh -huh. But you know, she did the work with Gary, and Gary said, 
she can do it. You know, she's our Leonora. She can, you know, and she did, and she delivers the goods. You know. So w the Gary, who, um, who yes, was, yeah, it was the music director? He or? was the musical director, yeah, yeah. not the, the composer was Carl Davis. Carl Davis, yeah. But uh, no, uh, Carl merely com did just the com but composed the score. Who's responsible for the wonderful tempo choices? It must have been Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. And he taught the actors how to, you know, worked with the musicians, uh, helped me. I mean, for example, you know, the Weber right. to piano. Yeah. I mean, that was, he helped to, or suggested what we should have, you know, and that sort of thing. But right from the start, but the overture, I mean, this, this Gilbert Sullivan is chronically performed too fast. Yeah. They just slow it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is, was wonderful. But I've also written a lot, and I've thought a lot about, um, the overlap between acting and singing. And I, I love music, great musical theater tradition, and you know, this work like this falls much, if I had to pick s singers, actors, for, I would lean on the side of the actors who sing, not the singers who act. Oh, you know, like for that. sure, yes, yeah, yes, um, yes. Because I love, in, in opera, which I obviously love, um, people can do these extraordinary things with their voices, and they, but they get so caught up with it that sometimes they forget what they're singing about. Yes, you know? yes. Whereas that never happens in musical theater, that no. actors always sing first and foremost as actors first. Yes. You know, like Timothy Small yes. does great singing in this film. Now, does he have a great voice? No. No. But, you know, but, <laughs> no. But he convinces you he does. You know, when, when, he, when he sings, he does. Sure. He is the Mikado. Oh, boy, is he. You know, and I mean, yeah, when I, when I was, uh, had agreed to direct the um, Pirates of Penzance, the English National Opera, I was, a little, you know, I, I, I was up for it, and everybody was enthusiastic. But I was a little bit apprehensive, because I'd never worked with opera singers right, as such. Yeah. And I thought, you know, what's this going to be like? In fact, the gang of uh, folk that did it were, I mean, they were, it was just like working with any good character actors. Right. They were on it completely. Right. And, of course, they could do all the, they could say they're opera singers. You know? right. So they do exist. Right, yeah. no, they do. And yeah. especially, in, I mean, that's where you have to say, the director, you would have had to say, Words, words, words. Words come first in the performance. You've got to make the words clear. You know, yes, I mean, I think for intelligent, modern right. performers, yeah. that comes with, they know that that's what it is. You right, know, right. And, you know, in terms of this story, the dramatic personal stories, um, and we get hints of it, actually more than hints in, in the film, but several of the, many of the actors from this troupe came upon bad times at the yeah, end of their yeah, lives yeah, and yeah. Had, in, lived, had money troubles and sure. suffered and were isolated. And sure. they didn't, I mean, these were, this film shows professional theater people who made a good living, but they weren't stars, you know. They, I mean, is, am I right? That's yes, my impression, yeah. Right. And, and the scene when they come in to negotiate for a little higher wage, it's like, you know, Grossmith was a big star. I mean, in, a, in that world, he, they did depend on him. But they did. I mean, he, uh, uh, it's referred to by the, the scene with, where um, the two actresses are talking about, she says, well, you know what you have to do. She says, she says, I don't want to go and have to perform to society after a show every night, but that's what they did. Grossmith, actually, in, 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 the, in real life, Grossmith not only performed in the theater, but he would go and do what they called concert uh, entertainment uh, at, at private dinner parties, going well into the night. And in the day, when he wasn't rehearsing, he worked at Bow Street's Magistrates Court mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a reporter. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they just burnt the candle at all ends, basically. Uh -huh. The mo morphine addiction, I think, is true. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And her alcohol all is absolutely. Yeah. That's all based on yeah. On, you know, and she did have a son by this. Yeah, movie. no, that's all. That's all yeah. as was. Yeah. yeah. Um, did did you get after this? Were you approached by um, opera companies or um, no, no. only the ones? No. Only the ones. Yeah. <laughs> I got uh, more sense. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you you did uh, pirates, but you didn't. You never um, were tempted to do an opera. Well, the the, the bottom line is that I've got. Uh, it's 
hard enough for me to do yes, my day job. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what does... Uh, uh, how do you I mean, when we when we um, I suggested to Jim Broadbent in 1992 that it might be a good idea for him to play W. S. Gilbert in a film. Wow, yeah. And uh, for the next seven years or so. He would check in with me and my late producer, Simon Channing Williams, to see how we were doing and how uh -huh. it was going and so on and so forth. Um, that's through the time we were making Secrets and Lies. And, right, you know. yes. Um, and so we, when I sat down with the great casting director, Nina Gold, to cast this when it finally got to it, we knew we'd got Gilbert. Right. But the question was, who is going to play Solomon? Solomon, right. And... I said, you know, whoever plays Solomon has got to be a musician right. as well as an actor. And she said, well, to tell you the truth, the only person I can, re the only actor I can really think of who ticks all the boxes is Alan Corduna. But Alan Corduna is not around. He's in New York, and he's playing the um, the chief steward um, in Titanic the musical <laughs> on Broadway. <laughs> I didn't and know he's that, not yeah. he's not available, yeah. so I, I, I so that's a shame. And so we talked about various other people, and and really it, it was you know not not it wasn't going well. Um, and then she said, "Look, Alan Cortuna in his contract, he he can have three days off, so he's going to come to London and meet you." So so he right. came to London and we met, and it immediately was obvious that he was a candidate. I said, "But I, you know, I've got to." do a practical audition with you as, as well. And so it so happens I was coming to New York to do the press for mm -hmm. my film Career Girls mm -hmm. and while he was still on. So I borrowed a rehearsal space for the piano from somebody and we did a bit of the acting stuff. And then I said to him, okay, I, I, you're a pianist, and, you know, what, what can you play? He said, well, what do you want me to play? So I said, jazz, jazz board out. Wow. <laughs> I said, musical, musical. Uh -huh. I said, um, you know, Offenbach, I mean, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, that guy could play anything. Right. And so I went to see Titanic, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, I mean, actually, a bizarre show. I'm sure somebody, somebody saw it. I mean, the thing is, how do you have a musical about a terrible disaster? Right. <laughs> there they were at the beginning, you know, um, mm -hmm. Sing, it's a great ship, it's a great... great and yeah. then, at the end, they, repri they reprise the, the beginning, but the ghosts of the, um, uh, of the dead walk amongst them. And, of course, the other great thing about it, you will remember, is that uh, 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 at, the, at the crucial moment, the set did this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, we, so we, I w met Alan, and we went to... Joe Allen's in New York, and yeah. I offered him the gig, and uh, he he didn't really know Sullivan at all. He didn't. Oh, and so yeah. he, next time I was in New York, I went to see him in the party. He was still doing the the uh, sinking ship, <laughs> and uh, he uh, was surrounded by Sullivan, and he was absorbing it wow. and uh, all that. But you know, you had you, you have to have people that can really do it. You know? Well, especially with that character, that me that composer. I mean, you can't fake that kind of musicianship, you can't. You can see it in a film when an actor really isn't singing or yeah. an actor really isn't playing an instrument and can work, but he, no, but he's so natural well, I mean, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just exudes from him. And you can imagine Sullivan as played by that actor, you, this music just responding to Gilbert's words, yeah. you know, like that. Um, uh, did he keep up in, in, in both fields? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, did uh, did he continue to act and do musical things? Well, you know, he's yeah. al yes, he's always done musical yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. In fact, he was in, he was here in next door in um, My Fair Lady. He played Colonel Pickering for two years. Oh, he, oh that's right. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, you know, I did read that. How do you feel, just in terms of? Um, uh, maybe this is hard to say in terms of your career and the films you've done. Where does this fit now? Do, do you this it, film? Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it it it, it, um, it was my first period film, uh -huh, yeah. and then we made V 
Vera Drake, Vera Drake. which is yeah. a, a, a set in 1950. Right. And then we made Mr. Turner, Turner and yeah. the last film I made was Peterloo, Peter about Lou, the Peterloo right, Massacre yeah, yeah. in Manchester in 1819. Um, what's fascinating about, uh, I mean, uh, this is not quite answering your question, it sort of is, uh, about th this film and the way it's gone down in the world, it is that, well, when we made it, it was backed by, uh, it had French backers. And when we'd finished it, they popped over to London to see it. And they looked at it and they said, this is terrible. This is just terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> they <didn't> really? <laughs> and they said, and we'd assumed, because I would already um, been to Cannes a few times and we'd at the Palm Door for, um, <laughs> right. for Secrets and Lies. We were going to take it to Cannes. No way, you, you can't, if, if they, quote, I quote, if you take it to Cannes, the critics will eat you alive. Uh -huh. and we thought, oh, we've made a really shit film. <laughs> 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 you know, and um, uh, I thought it would sink without trace. <laughs> and what's interesting is that it's immensely popular yes. and also young people and yes. people that aren't, Gilbert and Sullivan, never heard of it. Yeah. people really l like it, you know, so, you uh -huh. know. so I kind of, uh, I'm very fond of it. Yeah. Did, did you, was, did you have to rally a sales campaign to get it made? Did you have to convince a lot of people? Oh yeah, yeah and my yeah. producer, yeah. now deceased, um, sadly from cancer, um, yeah, he did, and he was very clever in putting together a whole bunch of d different... Uh, but, the, but the principal backers were the Fr these French government. Right. Uh, but yeah, no, um, y there was a lot of hustling went on to, to get it uh, going. But I, I could ima imagine this f film with... Uh, I mean, you were obviously the maker of Secrets and Lies, but also cue into the drama of these c people involved, and, you know, the, the sadness and the sure. tragedies and... Uh, um, even the deceptions, you know, I I the fronts that they that, that they put up, yeah. and, uh, even something like the costume fitting scene, is brilliant. Uh, because both, both the costumes, both of them, yeah, the, both the the men and then the women. I mean, because it, it's funny, but it's really there's a lot at stake for them. I sing without a corset. Are you talking? You know, well, like apart from anything else, I mean, we haven't said this in a way that's kind of obvious, but you know, I, I, having spent. Uh, many years, no, decades, in show business, in right. the theater, and I've worked in the theater a lot. Right. I mean, apart from anything else, what this film is, uh, is finally turning the camera around on us. I said right. it at the beginning, uh, you know, it's a film about we who take right. the business seriously of entertaining other people. Right. And so, apart from anything else, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the film is full of stuff about how actors are and how people behave right. and how, you know, the whole thing of vanity and, you know, insecurity. And, and insecurity, right. both, yeah. yeah, yeah right. You know, well, this time watching it, I, uh, I focused on something I had missed before, didn't really sink in before, when this wrenching scene when Gilbert says we're going to drop the Mikado song and then he says, I apologize, I wasn't clear. It, it's not, you were fine, I, it's the song that's unspeakable, you know, it just, uh, just has to go. And the cast rallies, especially the chorus members. That actually happened. Really, that did happen. Oh, it did happen, Wow, yeah. okay. It really happened. Um, you know, I mean, of course, you know, you, every book you read about it just says it happened, but nobody says how it happened or where they stood or what they said, or, but it did happen. Now, what, what I, the detail that struck me is when they're having that meeting where he makes that announcement, doesn't, why didn't Sullivan stand up for his own song? Well, I think, uh, I would say that that's because th it, they would regard it as Gilbert's prerogative to, um, d as director and as, um, uh, 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 as being responsible for the content and the, uh, uh, and the substance uh -huh. of the thing. I mean, they would leave that to his judgment. Really. Uh -huh. um, and indeed, I it's very clear uh, when you see it that, that, that Sullivan, it's this, comes from left of field for Sullivan, as right. he's not expecting it. Yes, but he wrote the music. It's his song, too. I would think he wants... He, but it, it sh it, that is my understanding, what you depict, depict. I'm not an expert on Gilbert and Sullivan, but the, the, 
that he was the Gilbert was the de facto stage director. Yes. That, that yeah, 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 yeah. And well, he was the stage. Yeah, he was. And in so. fact, apart from anything else, I mean, he he wrote a huge number of plays. Right. You know, uh, straight straight plays, right. and he was one of the pioneers of what we would now call directing, what right. for many years was called producing. Uh -huh. um, uh, 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 because prior to that period, um, which is sort of the 1870s, really, uh, there was no, and really well into the early 20th century, there was no, the, 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 the director didn't exist. They had what they called a stage manager, right. which is not what we um, now call a stage manager, uh, who sort of, sort of chaired the proceedings and just make sure it was practical. But the, the idea of mise-en-scene, right. of interpretive directing, right. such as we would now understand, or we would understand from the 20th century, uh, just didn't exist. And Gilbert was one of the early pioneers. He really was. I, it. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, that was my, that's my understanding of that, of that century too, that um, in, in opera too, that there was a stage manager. And then also in the theater, the, the producer, as you ju yeah. just said, was a much more creative role than we well, think of it today. You know, like the producer really brought no, things together, kind of conceived. No, well, what I'm saying yeah. is that that wasn't the case right. until towards the end of this, and it only really began a bit. Uh -huh. There wasn't, I mean, you know, a lot of um, huge, uh, 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 one gathers that um, the people that were most famous for anything that we would call directing or what you right. just described, were actually the actor managers huh. who yeah. played all the central Shakespearean roles and uh, organized the whole thing so that it was round their egocentric performances. Uh -huh. um, but, the, but, the, but the notion of creative, interpretive mise-en-scene, uh -huh. you know, actual um, directing was really non-existent until really properly into the 20th century. Uh, 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 but Gilbert was one of the early pioneers. There were two or three others who started to uh, Im have disciplined, uh, interpretive, creative uh, function. You know. Do you think beyond the realm of the Savoy Theatre and his work uh, with, with Sullivan, that was he acknowledged as such oh, yeah, at the yeah. time? Oh, no, and his play. He's wrote mm -hmm. some great plays, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. And um, so, uh, in other talks, have you talked about what's next for you? What you're, uh, I'm uh, having a great deal of trouble raising the money to make a film. Ah. So I can't talk about what's uh, next. Yeah, yeah. Because that's a battle. Right. It, it's amazing how many. I, I was friends with Stephen Sondheim, who died, of course, last year. And you can't imagine how even somebody as colossal as that, how hard it was for him to get. I know. Pro a show produced. You it's know, crazy. Like you yeah. think, son, I'm, you know, like, but I it's know. really crazy. It's just the costs involved are just so, so tremendous. But yeah, it's also having people trust. Uh huh. I have no idea what where time it is. Do we? Well, there's nobody left running, in the audience. Yeah, yeah, They've yeah, all yeah. gone home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think we're sort of under pressure to r wrap it up a little. Yeah, we can. Um, is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to that you'd well, like to say? Plenty we didn't talk about, but there's, there's nothing plenty, I want yeah. to say. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Um, but is there anything in particular that no. seeing this film again? May, no, I, I mean I, I've sat in on it and watched yeah. it. Yes. And I, yeah. I, I like watching it. And it good. <laughs> That's it good. A, it gives me a. Would you do anything differently looking at it now? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't. I never really find the, that with my films. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. Uh -huh. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. There, there is one thing actually. There is one. Uh, there are two mistakes in them. No, th no, sorry. There's one famous mistake, which I would do differently. Okay. It's the clangor, really. Uh, in the scene where um, Gilbert and Sullivan and Doyle Cart and Helen and are having that final right. discussion, which re results in an arm pass. Yeah. Um, Gilbert says to Sullivan, if you want to write an opera about a, a, a prostitute, uh, I have a bad time, I go and talk to Mr. Ibsen right. in Oslo. <laughs> now, we took the film to the Venice Film Festival. We were very pleased with ourselves. Everybody loved it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had a big screening. 
And as we, I was with Jim Broadbent, as we were walking out, um, a Scandinavian journalist <laughs> said, excuse me, can I just say that Oslo wasn't called Oslo till 1926. It was <laughs> called Christiana. <laughs> and the terrible news is, I knew that, but I'd forgotten it. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I know my Ibsen. Yeah. And so, yes, I would change that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> the other thing is, I mean, I, this is just f f for um, any Gilbert and Sullivan anoraks that happen to be here. <laughs> I, um, I, I, the great Irish actress, Breeze Brennan, does us the favor in the film of being, when, during the first night of the Mikado, Gilbert is skulking around back streets, back alleyways, and she's the, she plays this mad Irish woman who jumps on him. And right, right, yeah. Her. And she screams at him, who made the world, she says. Now, the next opera that they wrote was Ruddy Gore. And in that opera, it has this character, Mad Margaret. Right, Mad Margaret, right. Who appears mad and wild in the first act and has this song which begins cheerily carols the lark over the cot. Mm -hmm. um, if it had occurred to me, which it didn't till it was too late, she would have screamed, the, the, the woman, the Irish woman in the alleyway would have screamed at him, cheerily carols the lark. <laughs> <laughs> Suggesting, you know, anticipating. Yeah, anticipating, right, but yeah. But you know what, that's, yeah. that's a real anorak academic. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the Oslo thing is an embarrassment. Oh. <laughs> anyway, the film is magnificent and it's, um, it's as fresh as can be. And uh, I, was, I know it very, very well and I was thrilled to watch it again. And right. Mike Lee, congratulations thank and thank, thank you, you so much for being here.